Okay, sorry, I, I had trouble joining for some reason. All right, so we're getting started a little late here. Okay, so I want to I want to dig into chapter three today, and I'm I'm gonna I do want to stop and just take time to make sure we we answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah, let's see. Some people are having trouble. I don't know. Let me see what it says. It should let you jo join the meeting. I, I'm there now. There are 29 other people there, so I'm not sure what's going on in your case. But uh, just close what you're doing and start over and put in the meeting ID, the same one that we've used for all the other uh, lectures last week. Oh, okay, it works now, okay. Okay, all right, so, um, okay, can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right, good. All right, let's, uh, so let me- Yes. First. Okay, good. So let me, um, let me pull up the syllabus real quick. I don't know. So give me two seconds here. Okay, let's see, I think I'll share my screen and so this is week two. So uh, can everybody see this okay? Yes. All right, so, so this is week two and uh, so we'll meet uh, Monday, Tuesday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and since uh, Friday may be a problem, so I'll tell you on Wednesday, I may have you watch a video on Friday. I may do a video for that. I'm not sure because it's so hard to do it from school because my office computer broke that they haven't replaced it yet. And using my laptop is just not workable. Um, so anyway, but uh, so I may have you, I may do a video and have you watch a video on Friday uh, because I, I have to be there for lab. Now, normally it's going to work fine because I'll be in lab and then I'll walk down and I'll do my lecture and then I'll walk back to lab. Uh, but uh, since we're doing it online, it's problematic. And uh, so uh, the next two Fridays may be a little bit problematic in that regard. Uh, but uh, after that, it should be okay, hopefully. And it does look like the COVID numbers are, have peaked and we're coming down. So I'm optimistic that we'll be able to be back in person uh, after the next two weeks, this week and next week. So we'll see. Okay, uh, so we're going to dig into chapter three today, and uh, I will post the slides. I haven't put them on Blackboard yet. I'll put them on. Uh, the old slides are on there, but they they relate to the other book. This is a little different, and so I'm going to, I'll go through these today, and we'll see. I'll probably finish chapter three on Wednesday, so we'll see if, how far we get today. Okay, and then let me, um, let me go ahead and start this. Okay, can you all see this slide there? Yes. Okay, good. And then I, I'll probably do some examples, but anyway, I, I kind of want to go through this. So so here, here's what I want you to get out of chapter three. Uh, these are also repeated in the book. Uh, so I want, I want you to be able to give me several reasons why our, our tools for digital design are all based on binary logic. In other words, ones and zeros are true and false. And I'd like you to be able to write down the truth tables for an AND gate, an OR gate, an exclusive OR, a NOR gate, and an AND gate. Uh, and I, I might throw in the, ex, the uh, exclusive NOR gate too, the XNOR, which is also called the equivalence gate, or maybe I'll leave that for later. But in any event, I'd like you to be able to give me the, the, those five gates for sure. And those, those are really the, those are the, those are pretty much the gates. Uh, over time, that may change. We'll see. But currently, and for many, many years, that's how we made everything. Uh, every electronic device, every digital electronic device you use is built on those gates. And that's it. Um, so turns out they're very powerful. And, and actually, for the most part, it's NORs or NANs. Because when we make an integrated circuit, 
it's a little cheaper and easier to make a NOR gate or a NAND gate. And so pretty much all of our actual uh, chips have NOR gates pretty much exclusively or NAND gates pretty much exclusively on them. Uh, Would we be building this in lab? What's that? Would we be playing with these chips in lab? So, so remember, I, I don't teach the lab course. Uh, 2511 is taught by Patrick, Dr. Benavides, Patrick Benavides. Uh -huh. Yes, he does have, he does have, uh, he does have discrete gates. That's how they used to do the course. Uh, but I think uh, he may, he may push the lab course more into using hardware description language. So I'm not sure exactly what he's doing this semester, but uh, it's possible they may use HDL more, which is basically how we do it now. Uh, in the old days, we would use discrete chips and, and schematics and we wire them up and that's how we made stuff. But uh, if you remember, I gave the example of, uh, of a schematic for one of the latest NVIDIA chips being you know, some 20 plus square miles in size. So you can see why we can't really do that anymore. Uh, and if you try to build it out of discrete gates, can you, can you imagine? Uh, how many chips it would take to make something with a billion transistors on it. Uh, I, I mean, uh, if we went back to our 74 LS uh, series of gates uh, on discrete packages that each would have maybe eight pins or, or, or uh, 10 pins or 14 pins, and you'd have maybe four AND gates on a chip or something like that, four two input AND gates, how many of those chips you'd need to make something uh, equivalent to one of the latest NVIDIA chips, it would be, Unbelievable! I, you just you you would have a, have to have a circuit board the size uh, you know probably a probably approaching a square mile in size. It just isn't possible, uh, and that's why that's why we use hardware description languages now. So, but the 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 building blocks that we're using within the hardware description languages are these gates. So so, but yes, you can still buy. Uh, uh, a dual or a quad NAND gate with a couple of inputs or maybe a dual with maybe four inputs. And you can hook them up on a, on a whiteboard and you can get them to do simple logical things. But to really make complicated stuff, you need lots and lots of them. And, uh, and that's pretty hard to do with discrete chips anymore. But we'll be doing a lot of that in this course because of course we're starting with the basics. Uh, I want you to be able to implement a truth table uh, with a two-layer network. In other words, when we write a truth table, it represents hardware. And you can, and if you know how to do it, you can simply look at that truth table and immediately start drawing the circuit uh, that would implement that truth table. And usually you can implement it with just a handful of gates unless it's a gigantic uh, truth table. You can always implement it in two layers, no more than two layers. Uh, and the input layer can be a whole bunch of AND gates and the output layer one OR gate, or the input layer can be a whole bunch of OR gates and one output AND gate. And we call that our canonical forms, SOP and POS, and we'll talk about those more. All right. <clears throat> there are some equivalent uh, symbols for AND, OR, NORs, and NAND gates, which we'll, we'll talk about. This, this was sort of important back in the day when we actually used schematics, but uh, but it's helpful for you to understand how these things interact or interrelate. And so we'll cover this. Uh, but you, you, know, you probably only need this for logic design and then you won't come back to this again. And then I want you to be able to describe uh, several different, uh, what we call sets of complete gates that can describe any logic function in two layers. And we'll see that if we wanna use AND, we can use AND gates, OR gates and inverters, that's one set. But just NOR gates all by themselves is another complete set. Just NAND gates all by themselves is another complete set. All right, so why do we only use two-valued logic? Well, it, it, of course, in the, in the early going, uh, we, we, made, we made gates that just had uh, two values uh, because we, 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 we sort of started before we had the circuitry with just sort of the intellectual exercise before we could actually make these machines. In fact, the earliest machines were made purely uh, mechanically. Uh, and so when we uh, first started building uh, electrical devices, uh, electrically, electrical di digital devices to implement uh, our digital logic, 
we had already been developing the digital logic kind of in theory on paper. And then when we got the capability to actually make it in hardware, we just copied what we'd already done. So that's why we started with two value devices. And, and it turns out that we've stuck with this because as time's gone on, uh, we, we have built on the shoulders of our pre-existing hardware to develop our next generation. And, and although we changed some things, uh, the fundamental uh, design methods and the fundamental uh, pre-existing modules were reused. Sometimes the number of bits were increased, but, uh, but the basic uh, logic was reused for our next generation of chips. So for instance, uh, we have uh, the people that make the main processors in our desktops and laptops or uh, advanced micro devices in Intel. And uh, if you were to try and start a corporation from scratch today that was gonna make the next generation chip to compete with those, you'd be in a, you'd be in a tough position because your development time would take a really long time because AMD and Intel are leveraging all the work they've done over the last, you know, what, 40 years, uh, maybe 50. I forget when the, uh, the 4004 first came out, the, really the Intel first chip. And then they, that was a four bit chip. And then they came out with a, a 8008 chip. That was an eight bit chip. And then they came out with the 8080 and then the 80, uh, 186 and 8286 and 8386 and the 486 and the Pentium. And they've just gone from there. And uh, every chip they make uses a tremendous amount of technology from the previous chip. Uh, and all they're doing is just uh, fixing bugs and adding sort of some additional features and fine tuning certain parts of it and, uh, and changing, the, uh, changing the, the feature size on the integrated circuit so they can put more transistors on it, changing the voltage they're running it at so they can uh, so it'll generate less heat and they can pack things more densely and uh, making changes like that. Uh, to just to design all that from the ground up would just be unthinkable at this point. So we were sort of stuck with our two valued logic because that's that we've just built all this, uh, all this existing intellectual property. And that's what we call, we call these existing, uh, existing Verilog files are basically IP. And, uh, Math coprocessors, for instance, uh, I'm sure they're going back and modifying these because now our IEEE 754 standard has changed and they're probably having to make a bunch of changes in the math coprocessors. Uh, and then obviously we have a lot of legacy code uh, that, uh, and, and we have you know, very uh, powerful uh, op optimizing compilers, all, all written with an eye towards using these two value uh, logic uh, devices. Um, all of our design tools and our hardware description language is set up for two-valued logic. And uh, our hardware implementations all use two-valued logic. So there's lots of reasons why we're, we're, really, we're really kind of stuck with this two-valued world at this point. Um, downside? Well, if you think about it, uh, you certainly can use two-valued logic to do practically anything, uh, but uh, it may make it a little less easy to uh, come up with uh, uh, logic where we have sort of a maybe option, something in between true and false. And uh, that's how that kind of gave birth to fuzzy logic. But of course, fuzzy logic is implemented with strict two-valued logic. Uh, but some of these more uh, exotic uh, types, of, uh, types of devices might actually benefit if we you know, changed our, our fundamental way of operating from our two-valued logic to something else. Anyway, uh, one exception to our two-value world is that we do have a uh, flash that's, uh, that uses three-value and four-value logic in the storage cells. So there, so there are some cracks in this uh, two-value uh, fortress that's been uh, basically uh, the standard of digital design for so many years. So we'll see if that maybe slowly evolves and, and we start developing the tools and the theory and, uh, and, and uh, the mathematics to do uh, maybe three or four valued logic or who knows what. All right, so, so kind of our starting point is to look at, is to take a two input gate 
where we put two inputs, A and B in, and we get one output F. And if you think about it, uh, with two inputs, you have four possible input combinations, right? Is a, they both can be zero, they both can be one, one can be zero and the other one one. And so that gives you zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And because it's two binary bits, you can pretty well figure out immediately that you should have four different, uh, four different possible things uh, described that way. If that's the case, if you have four different combinations of A and B, then, uh, then you have uh, 16 possible combinations for your output. From F0 all the way to FF, using hex as our, uh, as our uh, uh, index here. So F sub zero would just be all zeros, F sub F would be all ones and everything in between. And it turns out of these, there are, uh, there are basically six that are useful. And that's the ones we just talked about. The only one I threw at the last minute was this X nor. So and, or, NAND, NOR, exclusive OR, and exclusive NOR. So those are the really six important gates. And if you look at the rest of this, you'll see that the rest of these things are, um, are related either to these gates or they're just sort of things that aren't all that useful. Um, so for instance, uh, so all zeros, that's not particularly interesting. All ones, that's not, particularly interesting either. Uh, uh, here we have uh, F2 say is 0, 0, 1, 0. Well, so all that is, uh, is the inverse of uh, the, end. Uh, it's just inverse these two rows. And what that really says is uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's kind of a strange combination. Now, would this be, would this be usable? It, it may have some useful properties. And uh, you'll find that probably not a lot of work's been done looking at how that might be useful. Now, this one, this is just A. This, this just gives you the input A. Uh, in fact, I actually have at the very end, I, here, I, I kind of listed them all out. So, so this is, this is AB prime. This just equals A. This is A prime B. This just equals B. Here's our XR gate. Here's our OR gate. Here's our NOR gate. Here's our exclusive NOR gate. This just equals B prime. This equals A or B prime. This equals A prime. This equals A prime or B. And, uh, and then this is the NAND gate. And again, this is just equal to the constant one. And this is equal to the constant zero. So, so you can see that, uh, that we have um, really there of all these, most of them sort of sort of either are not particularly interesting or useful, are they kind of, uh, are they basically devolved to, uh, to these combinations? Okay, uh, so the ones we're really interested in is AND, exclusive OR, OR, NOR, exclusive NOR, and NAND. And now we're gonna look at these individually. Well, uh, oh, before we do that, we wanna talk about Huntington's postulates. And these are just sort of guidelines he gave to try and make, uh, uh, to try and uh, create a foundation uh, for this Boolean algebra that then, then George Boole really uh, expanded. So the first one is this idea of closure. Any operation must give a result of true or false. Identity. Uh, so if we have, if we, uh, or x with zero, we get x. If we and x with zero, we get zero. If we or x with one, we get one. If we and x with one, we get x. And then commutative means you can reverse the order. X ordered with y is the same as y ordered with x. The order doesn't matter in anding either. And then this idea of distributed, we can group these things uh, in a way, in, in several ways, and we get the same thing. Now, this is true for anding and oring. This is not true for nanding and noring. Uh, that the, the inverse in that. NAND and the inverse in the NOR screws things up. And then we can complement. If we OR X with its complement, you always get a one. If you AND it, you always get a zero. And then find zero and one are never the same. They have their, so there's closure, 
Every operation must give a result of true or false, and there's distinct. Zero and one have to be different. Can't be the same. All right, so let's so we'll take just a few minutes and go through these and look at uh, each of the gates. So so this is this symbol is the AND gate, and um, it it can have any number of inputs. But the way this gate works, say with two inputs, is the output is always zero unless both inputs are one. If you have three inputs, the output is zero unless all three inputs are one. So an AND gate works. Everything must, all of the, uh, all the inputs must be one. Now, if you do a search online and you use an, an AND operator, if you say search for George and Joe in this database, what you will get is you, will, you, you really get an OR function. So, it, so this use has been bastardized on the internet pretty horribly. Uh, what, what, that, what, what that logically should give you is only entries where you have both George and Joe, but that isn't what you'll get. If you type in George and Joe in your search, what you'll get is all the entries that have George or Joe. And so some will just have George, some will just have Joe, and maybe a few will actually have both. Uh, and, but that's not what and means. So you have to, you, you probably have to change your thinking about how you've thought about uh, uh, the and operation because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we have three daughters and I, our oldest daughter always used to describe uh, herself in the context of her, her next sister down. We, she would always say Amy and me. Well, that, that would be the correct use of and. That would mean they were always talking about the both of them together. But uh, in, the, in the typical use, in a, in, if you search on the internet for something, you're using it really to mean or and not and. So, so, so at this point, you have to become a purist and you have to remember that and, the only time and is true is when all the inputs are true. If any input is false, the and is automatically false. All right, and we, we represent that by, by multiplication. Now, why did we do that? Lord only knows, but that's how they did it. So when we write A times B, and sometimes, most of the time we'll write it without the, without the, op, the, op, the operator in here. Uh, what, we're, what we mean in logic design is we mean A anded with B. And if we write A, B, C, we mean A anded with B anded with C, a three input AND gate. And, and so whenever we use multiplication in Boolean out in switching algebra, we, we're, basically, we're basically indicating the anding function. And whenever we use addition, then we're indicating the OR function. And that's how we write it, A plus B. Again, we're not really adding, because if A is one and B is one, F is still one, it's not two. So there's no such thing as addition. There's no such thing as multiplication in the digital world. And there's definitely no such thing as subtraction uh, or uh, division. We, we just stole the concepts of multiplication and we stole the concept of addition from regular algebra and applied it to switching algebra in sort of a funny way. And you just have to kind of erase from your mind this concept that, uh, that A plus B is addition. It's not, it's ORing. And A times B is not multiplication, it's ANDing. All right, so here's our OR gate. The OR gate's a little different. Now, let me ask you a question. Is the OR gate, is the OR gate the, uh, is it the inverse of an AND gate? So if you take an AND gate and invert it, do you get an OR gate? I would say no. No. Yeah, that's right, you don't. But logically, they're the inverse operations of each other. So. When we invert an expression, we substitute all the AND gates for OR gates. Or if we have OR gates, we substitute AND gates for the OR gates and OR gates for the AND gates. So when we invert an expression, we, we flip all the gates. So in that sense, they are kind of the inverse of each other, but they definitely don't give the inverse result. If you think about it, an AND gate has all outputs are zero, except when all the inputs are one and then it's a one. That's not true in an OR gate. In OR gate, the only time you get a zero is when everything's a zero, but you get a one everywhere else. So if we, if we went back here and we inverted this, we'd have one, 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 zero. We get a zero when both inputs are one, 
and we get ones everywhere else. And that is, in fact, what you get out of a NAND gate. But that's not what you get out of an OR gate. So, so don't, so there is a sense in which the AND gate and the OR gate are inverts of each other, but, but you don't get, by putting an inverter on the output of an OR gate, you don't get, you don't get an AND gate, you get a NOR gate. And by putting an inverter on the output of a NAND gate, you don't get an OR gate, you get a NAND gate. And a NAND gate, a NOR gate, an AND gate, and an OR gate are four different unique gates. And you can see that if we go back and look at this. There's an AND gate. There's a NAND gate. We can't see your uh, screen. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's what I was about to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Sorry. So if we go back and look at this, here's the AND gate. There's the NAND gate. The NAND gate is not the same as the NOR gate. Uh, as the OR gate, and it's not so. And all these gates are entirely different. And exclusive OR, ex exclusive NOR, OR, NOR, and NAND are all different gates. But when we work our, when we invert our logic expression, we change all our ANDs into ORs, all our ORs into ANDs, and we invert our variables to be the opposite values. So you can think of them a little bit like that. All right, so continuing. So here's an OR gate. And when all the inputs are zero, you get a zero. Otherwise, you get a one. If you have a three input OR gate, when all three inputs are zero, you get a zero. But if any of the inputs are a one, you get a one. All right. Uh, professor. Yeah. Why is it that um, in, in the last, uh where, where um, you can get A and B and you can still get an OR, like a, you still get a, a one in that section, even though we know it's not. It's okay, close. so let me, let me, yeah, let me go back then. Okay, so you're talking about uh, here? Oh, I'm you... talking about OR logic. Okay, so, so ask your question again. Yeah, I, I was just confused as to why um, one and one can also give a one for OR. Like A and B, when they both equal one, they also equal like uh, yes. Positive. Okay. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. So why why if they're both one, you get a one? Because this is called an inclusive OR gate. And and if in the case of an exclusive OR gate, when one when the two inputs are one and one, you do get a zero. But that's a different gate. That's an exclusive OR gate. Would with Would an OR be... gate, okay. I was just going to say, with an OR gate, it doesn't matter as long as one input is one, the output yeah, so will be one. Right. It's either OR if it's either one or zero. What's that? You get the, for the OR uh, for the OR gate, it's either one or zero. If you get one or zero, either one for A or B, then it'll be true. Yeah. If one of the inputs has to be a one for the output to be true. Well, for the for the OR gate? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I just asked because uh, I wasn't sure why you'd have an inclusive and an exclusive, but I guess that just helps with variety. Um, yeah, it's, it's so uh, it's interesting that they named them that way, but that's how they did it. And you, you just have to kind of learn that. Uh, what we normally call the inclusive OR gate, we don't use the word inclusive, we just write OR gate. And uh, with the exclusive OR gate though, we always use the word exclusive. But here's a question. Uh, so if we have a three input OR gate, sorry, if we have a three input exclusive OR gate, uh, what do we get for that? And that's, that's a little bit confusing. That, that can be tricky to figure out. Let's see if I can make this work. I'm having, having trouble with my camera the other day. But let's see. One second here to bring this up.
this over here. All right, so so if we if we use um, oh, let's see, I guess I better put it so it's going to be yeah, it's upside down, so I have to switch it. Okay. So if so, if, let's say we have um, so let's say we have an exclusive OR gate. And we have three inputs. So we have A, B, C, and we have an output F. So, so we have oh, I don't know why I did that backwards. That's stupid. Um, let me do that again. So, so here are the inputs. A, B, C, and I'll put F. We have one, two, three, four. And we'll roll do them in pairs just to make it easier to follow. So, so if we have all zeros, so this will be. So F equals the exclusive OR of A with B with C. Or if you write it in C notation, A, B, C, because the, the upside down caret thing is the exclusive OR symbol. All right, and that's also true in very long. All right, so if we have all zeros, what would we get for F? Uh, you'd get a, a zero. That's right. What about if we have uh, if C is one and the rest are zero? Zero. No, we get a one there. One. Is, this a, is this an OR gate or uh, exclusive? exclusive. Or? It's exclusive OR. Okay. Because we use oh, the okay. carrots here. But either way, we get a one there, right? Yes. Okay, and then, so since, since we already determined that if we just have the single inputs one, it's gonna be one. So that makes this one a one, and that makes this one a one. What if we have two inputs that are one? Zero. zero. That's right. So this is a zero, and this is a zero, and that's a zero. And then the final question is, what about three inputs that are one? One. It turns out that one is correct. But if you think of the name exclusive or, maybe it shouldn't be. So really it's more like an odd even gate, isn't it? Uh, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of goofy or an odd gate, I guess it would be the right term. So, but this is the correct answer. And, and, it's, and it's a little bit disconcerting. I, I've always found that to be a little upsetting as far as I'm concerned, but that's what it is. So when you go to three inputs, it, it gets a little weird and it, and it doesn't behave so that you have a, an exclusive, uh, that exclusively only one input can be one. It's, it's now it's, if you have an odd number of inputs that are one, it'll be one. So if you just have one input or three inputs, or if you had a five input, same thing, five inputs. Okay, and then, uh, so then, so this is the standard OR gate, which we can call it the inclusive OR. This is the inverter. Now the bubble can be on either side here. It can be on the input or it can be on the output, but not on both. And basically if you put in X, you get out X prime. So we'll say this is the output. I probably should, probably should have put those in. Uh, all right, and here's our exclusive OR. And we've already talked about this. So, it turns out then that for the most part, uh, these functions, the, the really important ones would be, would be and uh, or, uh, or exclusive or, and then exclusive nor, ex, uh, nor and NAND. And these exclusive or, nor and NAND are just the same as the original gates and or and, uh, and nor and exclusive or with an inverter on the output. So if we, 
so if we uh, so if we want to uh, so if we want to look at at what a uh, say if we have an OR gate here and we want to make it an OR gate, we just put a bubble on the output. Or yeah, uh, or you could if you want you can you can actually put an inverter on the output, and that would be that. So that would be that's a NOR gate. But we normally write it like this. In an AND gate, we just put an inverter on the output. In an exclusive NOR gate, same thing. Yeah. Inverter on the output. This bubble. This little bubble always means that whatever comes before it on the other side of the bubble, it's been, in, it's been flipped. So if it's one here, it's zero there. If it's zero here, it's one there. And that of course is the same thing that our little inverter does. We put X in, we get X prime out. Okay, now let's see. Um, Uh, get this off. All right. So we we do have what are called alternative symbols, and these are these are kind of interesting because um, they 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 help us a little bit make sense out of our. Uh, uh, sometimes when we're doing our schematics. Um, we we can we can swap these symbols out and then we can uh, we can combine our inverters and do things to to switch to graphically switch from one form to another form. Mostly we'll do that algebraically, but but you can also do it on paper with these symbols and and some people find that to be a lot more uh, satisfying. And let's see, for some reason, this we lost our column. Let's go fix it. No. All right. Well, anyway, so this this is the AND gate, but you could also write an OR gate with bubbles on all the inputs and on the outputs. And here's an OR gate, but you could also write it as an AND gate with bubbles on all the inputs and the output. And here's a NAND gate, and you can write it as an OR gate with, with all the bubbles flipped. So you take this bubble off. And you put bubbles on the two inputs. So you have two inputs, but no bubble on the output. And that, and then you change the AND to an OR. And that makes that's the equivalent symbol for a NAND gate. And for a NOR gate, same thing. You flip the bubble on the front and you flip, you flip on bubbles on all the inputs. Flip this one off, flip these on, and you get uh, an, an AND gate with bubbles on the inputs only. And that that becomes equivalent to a NOR gate. So it's, it's good to write these down and just keep these in the back of your mind. Uh, you may find when we do, uh, we're going to do a lot of problems where we switch the SOP form into the, the POS form. And uh, when we do that, uh, you're going to find that, uh, that you, um, that some, for some people, this will make more sense. So, uh, it can get kind of tedious, but but you may want to fiddle with it. Let's see if I can uh, do this. Bring this back up. So, so for instance, let's see if we can do an example here. Um, so let's let's say we have um, let's let's say we'll take a logic expression. Now, uh, one of the things we do and. When we write, so I'm going to review a little bit of what we've already covered. So let's say we want to write a logic expression. Well, first of all, we're going to use variables. And uh, we'll use operators. And our operators are going to be are going to be anding, which will use multiplication, and oring, which will use addition. And then we'll use a little apostrophe for inversion. Uh, if we do use exclusive ORs, we'll probably write them with a plus sign in a circle like that. In C notation, though, our anding is an ampersand 
and orin is a vertical bar iron uh, iron uh, and and our exclusive or is the carrot and our invert is either the tilde if it's bitwise or the apostrophe if it's logical and also with these we duplicate these double ampersand is logical and uh, anding double bar is logical orin there is no logical exclusive orin defined because is this when we write in like code for yeah. like in a program uh-huh and also we'll use it in very log so both in c and in very log same thing and we'll we'll use we'll occasionally use this notation in the course but mostly in the course we're going to use this and also this okay uh, so let's write a little logic expression. So we'll do, uh, so let's say our variables are A, B, and C, but they can appear as A or A prime, B or B prime, C or C prime, where, where A prime just means the inverse of A. So if A is zero, then A prime would be one. And let's say we have something like A prime times B times C. So that's, a, that's an expression. Now, Somebody tell me, what gate does that represent? An AND gate? No, it's an AND gate. You said, oh, because you said times to multiply, and then yeah. it has the inverse? Yeah, there, well, the inverse only applies to the A. So we don't think of this. So this would be, this would be an AND gate with A prime going in, B and C going in, and say F coming out. So the inverse only applies to the variable A. We could also write that, we could take off the prime and we could put a bubble here. Does that make sense? Whereas if we inverted and the, go ahead. I was gonna say the uh, the reason you put the, the bubble just on the inverse was the, it was because the of the alt. Well, so oh, for the inverse of the A. Yes, it's just the A. See, we're only oh, inverting just, the A. Oh, okay. If we put a, if we made a NAND gate, we put a bubble here. We'd be inverting the result of it, which would be equivalent to writing A prime B C parentheses around it and a prime on the parentheses. Now we've inverted the whole thing. This is a, a NAND gate. In fact, if we use if we use a if we use algebra to write, so an AND gate, we just use, we'll use parentheses. So an AND gate is ABC in parentheses, three input AND gate. A, an OR gate would be A plus B plus C. But a NAND gate would be ABC with a tick on it. And a NOR gate would be A plus B plus C with a tick on it. And an, ex, an exclusive, and if we threw in the exclusive OR gate, we'd we'd have A exclusive OR B exclusive OR C, and if we did the NOR the 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 exclusive NOR gate the X NOR, then we'd have A exclusive OR B exclusive OR C with a tick on it. Does that make sense? Excuse me, professor. Yeah. Could you go over those again? Sure. Uh, just like from the top. So I can, yeah. Uh, down. So this this equals and. This equals or. This equals nand. This equals nor. This equals xor. And this equals x nor. So whenever we put this, we're gonna get we're gonna get the end. So when you use that um, that other um, plus with the circle, uh, that's you know it's a uh, exclusive. Yes, that means exclusive or. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, let me. I think I'm going to stop there for today and give you just a chance to to ask any question that you might have about what we covered. This is this is you know. 
you'll find in, in just a in just another you know a couple of lectures and another week this is going to be old hat to you but when you first see it it's a little if you've never gone through it before it's a little you know it's a little confusing and you go oh my god this is bizarre but actually it, it makes a lot of sense and and then here's the good news this is all this is it that's it <laughs> that's the entire foundation of all our logic devices that's it that's all there is so of course it's important and uh and and it's amazing how powerful it is it's amazing that that complicated searches and and complicated ai algorithms uh you know neural nets and all that can be implemented with gates that just have these function that this functionality in fact it turns out that that nand gates all by themselves can do anything nor gates all by themselves can do anything and i that's that's true of exclusive uh, well for sure the exclusive nor gates as well and but and gates and or gates need to be together along with inverters to be able to do anything kind of interesting but that's that's how it is so the uh, the quiz at the end of chapter 2 is all screwed up and uh and so i'm working i i i emailed the uh, Great River Learning last night, and hopefully they're working on it today. I'll let you know as soon as it's fixed. And once it's fixed, you'll be able to take it again. So for those of you who took it and got a bad score, don't worry. And again, uh, I'm probably going to count as long as you get at least 50% on the test, uh, you'll get full credit for the, for the test. And it's going to count more or less like homework because uh, some of it will be some of it will be like homework. So. Uh, so the the tests of the quizzes are only on the uh, the online um, yeah. access. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're just on the textbook. Okay. So, um, so I haven't taken the chapter two quiz yet. Should I take it now? Uh, no. I mean, if you want to, you can, but it's it's going to give you a wrong. It's going to misgrade your your answers. So okay. uh, I'm not sure. Some of it may be, there may be one where I put the wrong answer in, but there are other ones where I clearly put in the right, right answer and it's still being marked wrong. And then some of it is where I've asked for two answers and that, and that was probably a mistake. One thing, let me just say one more thing real quick. I, I'm, let me go back to this real quick. Uh, whenever you write, uh, whenever you write, um, let's see. Uh, let's see, I want to make sure I um, lost my train of thought. Uh, let's see. So whenever you write, um, I want to make sure you get the notation right here, but I'm forgetting what notation I wanted to talk about. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, oh, whenever you write a hex number. So, so when you write 86, is that decimal 86 or hex 86? It, you can't tell. Now, if I write B87, well, you know that's that's probably hex because there's a B, which you wouldn't see in decimal. But if you have just the decimal digits in the hex number, you don't know. <coughs> Here's the notation we are going to universally use. If you write a hex number, you will always proceed it by zero capital X. If you write a binary number, always proceed it by zero little b. So you shouldn't see like a three in this number. That would be goofy because it's not a legal binary digit. So obviously, if you have this zero B in front of it, it should be a pure binary number. And if you have zero X, even if you don't have letters, you still know this eight is 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 a hex eight and not a uh, and and not a decimal eight. So that eighty six and hex is a very different value than eighty six and decimal. Okay, any questions about that? And, and remember that our legal hex digits, you know, are zero through nine, and then A, B, C, D, E, and F. And hopefully you all have memorized the four bit binary equivalents for all 16 of those digits. And if you haven't, please do that. To, please do that tonight. Just, just do that right after this class. Just, just write that. 
that list is uh, 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 the list was in the the slides from last time. It's also in the text. Just just and you can you can Google it online. Uh, and the ones that are tricky, you, these should be easy because you can look at them and figure them out real fast. Uh, but the ones that are tricky are the letters. A is 1010 and B is 1011 and C is 1100. So I always remember A and C and I usually figure and then I know F is one, two, three, four ones. So that that's really easy to do. And then, you know, D is well, it's going to be 1101 and um, E is going to be 1110. So. All right. So make sure you memorize those. And then uh, I'll see you Wednesday. And I will do an online, uh, I'll do an online uh, office time uh, at 1210. So you're welcome to come to that uh, if you have questions. Okay. All, All right. right. We, will, we will see you later then. I will post this lab, uh, I'll, po I'll post this video hopefully later today. By tonight, I'll get it posted. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe just uh, by two o'clock too. We'll see. Uh, excuse me, Professor? Yeah. Do you know um, if we have a recitation or that's not even your category? No, no, no it's 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 my thing. So he, he, the TA works for me and uh, he he did send out an email. Uh, so I think he's he's trying to set up a time. I believe uh, he said at one this afternoon. OK, yeah. So, if, yeah, if you didn't get that, if you didn't get that email, double check your your uh, email address on Blackboard because he used the Blackboard system. And, and Professor, if you haven't done the quiz yet, you can. Is it still open to do it? It's it's you can do it. I think it might have closed. I don't know, but I'm gonna make sure it's reopened once it's fixed. So if okay. you do the quiz now, you're gonna get it's gonna be misgraded. So okay. probably better just to wait. Okay. And one more thing, Professor Tyler posted it in the chat, but um, okay. just a couple things. Uh, some of us are kind of confused about how the homework is supposed to work for this class? So so here's how it is. The homework that's listed on Blackboard is homework. That's that's the legacy homework from the Roth book. Uh, I, I've sort of made the conscious decision to see how it works, to let the test at the end of each chapter be your homework for that chapter. And for some of the chapters, it's not that much, but <clears throat> eventually it'll be problems that you have to work and stuff. So. So the chapter quizzes at the end of each chapter in the textbook is technically our homework? Yes. Okay. That's the only thing I'm going to require. Right now, I, I've reserved the right to maybe give a few other assignments. Uh, I, 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 I'll have to comb through it. I'm either going to, you know, uh, some of the quizzes might need to be bulked up to give you an adequate practice. And so uh, I'll either do that or I may assign some additional problems. We'll see. But I'll yeah, let we're... you know for sure. For, as of we now, just, yeah, it's sorry. just just the just the test at the end of the chapter. Okay, yeah, because we were kind of confused because like when we go into the class on Blackboard uh, and we go down to like homepage, you can see like all the stuff, but some of it's like for old stuff. Some of it, yeah, uh, I, we were just kind of right. confused. Yeah, I sort of left it that way so you would have additional material to look at. I realize that adds a level of confusion. I may, I'll probably eventually take that away, uh, but it there were just. Uh, so many different things to get changed around that I haven't uh, haven't gotten everything switched around. But uh, but yeah. But again, the only homework you're responsible for. If you want to look at the other homework and do it, you're welcome to do it. That's fine. And you can probably find a copy of the Roth text uh, that's broken, and you can use that if you want. Uh, so you can always work more problems. Nobody nobody's ever going to tell you you can't do that. But um, uh, but what you're required to do is just at the end of the, each chapter in the, in the online book. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Any other questions? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah. So the, for the, the homework, it's your book, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Cause I, I did the, I did the homework for the other class, I guess. Can I still do the chapter one and chapter two homework? Uh, I'll make sure they're available. I it may they were supposed to set dates at the home that that they become inaccessible, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we've already passed that date. But uh, I don't know that they actually got that set up. So if it's still there and you want to do it, feel free. Uh, but remember, the first chapter I think grades correctly, 
but the quiz at the end of the second chapter has uh, about four missed grades and, and a couple of problems with it that I'm going to have to fix. Okay, so I'll, I'll make sure I do the first one to, and then yeah, I'll wait for the other one. Yeah, go ahead and do the first one. Okay, thank I, you. I also have a question. Um, on my book, it says when I was trying to do the end of the chapter quizzes, it says for, for me, all the due dates for some reason are on August 6th to 2021. Yeah, I, well, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll ask him about that. I know that I know the actual due date was um, was Friday. That was the due date, or the twenty eighth. I think it was the twenty eighth, maybe. Uh, so maybe not. Maybe it was actually Saturday. I think that's what I put down for it. Uh, but I don't know if that's what they actually assigned. Uh, I don't know. That sounds a little. That sounds strange. I don't know why that would be because the course hadn't even started then. And I don't think they would ever put a date in for that. So I, I don't know, probably should double check that and make sure you got that right. Okay. Um, I have a question too. Sir, for mine, it was both chapter one and two that weren't working. I called you on Saturday about it. Yeah, I guess there, I guess there was, uh, I, I think I looked at, oh, maybe maybe there was one on one. I, uh, I'll, I'll look at that too. I was thinking, I, when I went back and looked at one, I thought everything was graded correctly, but maybe it wasn't. So I'll look okay. at that. Yeah, okay, what, what, yeah, if, whatever I told you is right, but I, I, maybe I maybe I forgot that. Um, I'll double check that. Yeah, they may okay. have to fix. Uh, maybe there was one question on one, but I I don't know. I think it was probably okay. I'm not sure. All right. Anyway, we will. Um, <clears throat> I will see you on Wednesday, and hopefully we'll have have all that straightened out by then. Okie doke. We'll talk to you later.